So I was wandering down the wharf and old Rocco Irvin, who was skipper and owner of the Heckler, uh, I spoke to him there on the wharf and he said, you want a job lad? And I said, yeah. He said, well, the job in the Heckler. So I took the job in the Heckler. Well, I got two pound a trip. And that was big money because sometimes in those little trips across the Gulf, we would make two trips a week. And uh, the boy worked pretty hard. Now, it's pretty understand, I suppose, hard to understand for modern people. But we'd sail from the port and the skipper would be on deck until we got out of the harbour and the sails were set and everything else and then he'd go to bed. And he'd leave the 14 year old boy on the wheel and I wasn't the only one by a long way. There was nothing exceptional about my activities at all. It was a normal situation on the very small ones that carried only a skipper and a boy. And he'd go to bed and he'd say, now round about such and such a time you'll see this or that, he said, and give me a yell then. But of course, if there was any change in the weather, he would wake up immediately, he'd be on deck. You're supposed to call him, but he was usually there before you did. He'd pick it up. They had pretty good sort of instincts, those blokes. I think the worst trip I can ever remember in the Heckler, we'd uh, agreed to bring a lady and her daughter across from the other side of the Gulf. I don't know if it was Port Vincent or Stanfree or which one of those, one of those places to the Adelaide show. And all we really copped it. And uh, this poor lady, the daughter was all right, she wasn't that old and she was quite happy with it, but we have taken a bit of stuff aboard of her and she's bouncing around a bit, but I wasn't frightened, but I never had enough sense to be frightened when I should have been. But uh, the lady was on deck by the mizzen rigging and we had a bit of rope around her so she couldn't get washed over the side and uh, anyhow when Big C come over the side and give her a wallop and an old rocko said next one will be gone lady and she said i wish it did bloody well hurry up <laughs> and so, anyhow they didn't come back with us they said they'd walk home rather than come back old captain kilberg in the kirby he was called honest john or father kilberg because he was a very fatherly old man and when he went ashore when i was cabin boy in the kirby i was it was my place to accompany him of a night time anyway and, and carry his torch and his umbrella and he used to visit old cronies in various ports and they'd sit and yak on considerably about this that and the other and sit me in a corner with some books or pictures or something to shut me up and then I'd carry his torch back aboard. Rocco Irvin, skipper of the Heckler, yeah he, he'd come from a Ketch family from way back I think as he lad in, with his father, he'd been in an old kitchen called the Sailor Prince, because he often spoke of her. Well, he kept the heckler pretty smart. She was really painted up all the time, very clean and tidy. And like most of the kitchen skippers, he was a good bloke as far as I'm concerned. And he used to uh, dress up in a, a dark coloured blue suit and uh, a black hat, and quite often go ashore dressed like that with no boots on. And so, but uh, there's not much to say about him other than he was a hell of a good bloke and worked like hell. And he was um, pretty near blind and he had thick goggles, so he always had to have a boy that could see something and, and knew a little bit about something. But uh, no, Rocco was a wonderful bloke and he used to take, it, take me ashore with him when he went down to the office, Fricker's office, for uh, instructions or whatever his orders were. And Percy Fricker, the king of the castle in that place, was quite deaf. And he got a very early version of a hearing aid, which was a box that sat on his desk, and he had earphone things. And of course, Rocco had quite a good voice, and he was always used to shouting at Percy. And we went into the office, and he started hollering, and Percy said, now, now, Captain. He said, quiet down. He said, I've got that box there. He said, and oh, that machine, he says, and that amplifies things, you see. Oh, good, says Rocco, and he picked up the box and yelled into that. And flaming and blasted old Percy's head off. And then, of course, there was old Wally Peterson. He was master and of the Y Manor. She was a fair lump of a three-masted schooner. And uh, he used to lecture everybody on communism. He was a devout commo as Wally and, and I mean he wasn't so communistic when you were working for him but uh, his beliefs were that way and he used to smoke cigars and, and chew the butts and he was known as Cigar Wally and of course there was the horses and carts that used to work the waterfront and the uh, Arascarfs had a steam lorry and uh, and they also had two 
or maybe more motor lorries that were called Sauras and they were made in Switzerland and there was so much brass and pretty paint on them and we used to love looking at them and they had uh, a whistle instead of a hooter and it used to somehow work off the exhaust and when the fella pulled the string they'd go toot 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 and that was something and we looked, looked upon them as something that belonged to the port and uh, no, they, they were good oh. Us kids used to go down and we'd take a dinghy from any kitch we liked and go sailing and we got in strife with uh, Maxie Goggleman for pinching his dinghy and leaving our bikes aboard when he wanted to sail but that's beside the point, that was Lady Doris I reckon but we used to sail around all over the port in the dinghies when, when we had any spare time and the, they used to lay mainly at Birkenhead, Birkenhead and down the Copper Company and uh, there were the Coal Hulks, the Loch Tay and the Marion and various ones down there. There have been very, very notable sailing ships in their times and we were free to wander all over them. In fact, the Kitch kids were pretty well free to do anything they liked in the port and uh, we used to get around and do this, that and the other. And it was busy. You'd see them coming through the Perkin Head Bridge. And well, when I first went in them, the bridge wasn't finished, but when it was finished, it was a great novelty uh, for the start of things to sit and watch them towing them through and old Jack Murch he used to have a little ferry boat running across where the bridge is and I, I think it was a penny or something to go across in the ferry and Murch has laid or earlier than that they built the original dam that catch that's now preserved at Warrnambool isn't it? Yeah I think it's Warrnambool and uh, yeah, she was a bit different than the others but sailed like hell and go, she was double-ended like a great big dory. Yeah, so, and the story is that Murchie's used two telegraph poles for her keel and, and uh, obtained most of the other material wherever they could find it. So that's the original dam, but it was a great place and there was steamers coming and going all the time and the little smoky old Kapula and the noisy Karaka used to come up and down. Karata ran to Kangaroo Island and she used to hop along pretty well. But uh, the West Coast trade used to go around there at a certain time each year and pick up uh, cargo or grain from all sorts of little places and take it to Thevenard where it put ashore to wait for the larger overseas ships to pick it up. And uh, Scales Bay, one place I recall quite well, is where the grain came down a small cliff on chutes and the cargo boat, a big open boat, used to go in and take the grain from the end of the chute and then they'd bring it out. And as it was coming into the boat, it was made up into slings of six bags in a sling. And uh, there were six slings to the boat, that meant 36 bags in the boat. And that was brought out and lifted aboard and the crew would be waiting to stow it. And Paluby, another place, there was nothing there either. Uh, used to go in on the beach there and pick it up from a horse and cart that wandered out into the water. And uh, because I didn't do it, I was the cabin boy and I used to watch that. And my only contribution to the loading was occasionally of a night time, they would put me by the chute with a uh, little machine with a button on it counting the bags. And uh, I thought it was pretty important. And I got two bob an hour, I reckon for doing that. I'm, I'm not dead sure of that price, but I think it was something like that. And that was my contribution to that work. And I stayed in the Kirby for quite a while and we went to Tumby Bay and Arno Bay and Port Lincoln and you name it. I always loved Jermaine. It stuck in my mind forever, riding down the jetty on the little steam train and a little, a train ran right up the middle of the main street to the big wheat stacks. And, and that was pretty good. Aboard the Heckler, the boy drove the winch when we were loading on the on the port on the beach ports. We'd go up on the beach, and she'd be sat there with a bit of a list on her, and there'd be a heel block at the bottom of the mast onto the winch, and the uh, fall would lead down through that. It was offset, so that when you took the bag weight of the bag, it would pull the cargo gaff over the centre of the hold. And the fella on the wagon that brought the wheat out, he'd have a guy rope to hold it back until it was time to go over. So here you've got a 14 year old boy uh, driving the little motor engine on the winch and swinging the stuff in and lowering it down the hold for the skipper to stow. Because in the curb, in the heckler, the skipper couldn't stand up in the hold and neither could many other people if it come to that. 
and he had to load all that down there. She carried, I think, in the vicinity of 500 odd bags. It might have been up to 600 sometimes with big deck cargo. And there was always so many bags put alongside the cabin on the deck aft to give her the right trim from the old fella. That was his idea. Loading on the, the places with the horses and carts now, Clinton was one. They called it Port Clinton, but well, there was a shop there and a, a few shack sort of things that I can recall, possibly more that I didn't see. Well, you'd go ashore there and of course the, it was too muddy there for trucks and the cargo would be bought out with a horse team. And I can recall the fellow that drove out, his name was Bull. I don't know why I remember his name was Bull, but I thought he was an old man, but I was a young boy, so he may not have been. And he used to bring two young girls with him, and one of them had a crippled leg, I can remember that. And they used to sling off at me driving this winch, and I don't know why. But uh, they'd come out alongside, and, and, and as I mentioned earlier, I'd lift the stuff aboard with the winch one bag at a time and drop it down the hole to the old skipper and he'd take it off and stow it. So that's what happened there and at Dublin and uh, uh, Dublin and the other one over there anyway, I'll think of, it, uh, think of it after, they used to bring it out in motor trucks because the bottom was very hard there and they'd whiz it out. So uh, Port Parham was the other place that we took it off in the motor trucks. And further up, we'd, just below a place called Long Spit, they used to go ground there and pick up shell grit and the boy again drove the winch and you'd take an extra man for tipping the bucket, the skipper would be over the side or the man would be over the side, shoveling it into a t tumbling bucket thing and the boy would bring it aboard with the winch and sometimes he'd get stuck down the hole to help spread it. And uh, That used to go back to Port Adelaide and go to the glass works. The best thing to, you could hope for going back to Adelaide with grain or salt was to go alongside a steamer and that was good oh because you didn't do anything. The wharfies slung her out then and in the heckler they got sixpence an hour extra because she was so low and they reckon they was crawling around on their hands and knees so they needed a bit extra for that. I can recall that quite well and, and if it, there was a steamer in the port running out of space you would uh, hell of a race to get back there to see who, who got the bit of room so they didn't have to pay for discharging on the wharf. Heckler had no clutch or gearbox, no reverse gear, and you put a slip line on the wharf. You, if she was facing the wrong way, you'd have to turn around, and you point her the way you want to go and start the engine the way you went. I remember there was a fella called Alf. Uh, he was very simple, and it was very cruel, I suppose, but there was little bubbles used to come out out of the mud. And Alf queried this, he said, what's making those bubbles? And a fellow called Dicker was a bit of a smart aleck, he said, uh, oh, he said, them's caused by crabs farting, mate. And Alf was looking, he said, you know they're worth money, Dick told him. He said, they are, he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, the globe timber mills will give you a shrupens a bubble, because they put them in spirit levels, and you can't get anything better than a crab's fart for a spirit level. So they had poor old Alf in a dinghy with a teaspoon and a bottle trying to catch all these bubbles to sell to the Globe Timber Mills. And he woke up in the end and <laughs> damn near a blue over it because he was a big bloke. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but all those sort of things used to happen in the catches. It was a, a, a great place. The skipper would come aboard with his little kit bag or Gladstone bag thing. And if he looked like he had a bit of a list, you know, you're going to eat well that trip. But if he was standing upright, there was a few sausages in it and spuds and, and a bit of something to make a stew out of and some jam and some bread and eggs and that sort of thing. And if you caught a few fish, you were right. And aboard there, the boy did the cooking. And that was down in the forecastle with a piece of board across some spare anchor chain. And because in the beginning, the boy lived in the forecastle. Uh, there were two bunks, one or a couple, about three, three feet maybe above the deck and one right on the deck. But the only time they both were occupied was if you took an extra man when they went on the shell grit or something like that. But uh, after a while, if the boy was found to be fairly clean and didn't smell funny or snore too loud, you moved aft into the little cabin where the old skipper was one side and the boy was the other. And there was a little folding table there where you had your tucker and that sort of thing. 
The uh, conditions on the, the smaller catches weren't conducive to cleanliness and all that sort of thing, although most of us tried to keep as clean as we could. You, you got a wash out of the water tank in a basin, in a bit of a bowl or a cut down kerosene tin or whatever you could and sometimes you could rig up a hose off the wharf and have a shower under that if you felt that way. At, uh, on the Birkenhead wharf there was a horse trough and it differed from most of the others because it had a plug in the bottom. And we scrubbed that out and let the water out and have a bath in there and put the plug back after and fill it up for the horses because the kids of those days were considerate in that respect. These days I don't think they'd care much about that. But, uh, and that was quite a treat to get in there and have a scrub in the horse trough. The harbour lights are burning and the waterfront is still as I sit alone and dream of days gone by. Then from the storehouse of my mind, my memories of the past, come ghostly, silent, gliding through the night. Close by in slow procession, they pass along the way, past the mud banks and the mangroves out of sight. I can see the little catches that carried all the grain and lighted to the big ships standing clear. I can see the crewmen waving, I sailed with them, you see, and stowed the grain and helped them rig the gear. I see Heather Bell and Lurline with Adonis in the lead, her emblem standing proudly against the sky. Old Jack's there watching closely for any shifting of the breeze and any need to trim a sheet or slack a guy. He's held off every challenge he's competed for the trade and he'd have no smelly engine in his ship. He proved he didn't need one. He held his own and sailed as fast as those who steamed throughout the trip. The tiny heckless there as well, all painted up a treat, sailed by Rocco in his new blue suit and nothing on his feet. I see Doucher Strauss in Tikra, he's sailing all alone. He'll work as hard as any crew and load her on his own. Reg Harvey's stowing away the stores aboard the only what. They won't take much stowing, rice puddings is all he's got. Here come Hawthorne and the Eva, Harold Nelsaby and Hawk. Stormbird, Lady Doris, all competing for the work. The Lilith here looks lovely and sailing at her best. She was built to win regattas, but she's working like the rest. The Kurubi goes sudden by, with lashings on each derrick. Old Kilberg stands there on her bridge and talks of his son Eric. Dickie Megan and his one and all pass close by with Priscilla. Gus Berglund sails the old Gerard and Bert Tainch has Capella. There's the Burgoynes with Keringle and Bill swims with Shalatta and the active move by slowly in my memory's regatta. And now the scene is changing but the mangroves still abound. I see horses there and wagons and the catches are aground. They're loading from the beaches where no jetties have been built on good hard sand at Dublin on Clinton's mud and silt. The cargo gaffs are swinging from midships to one side. Friction winches screech and clatter to beat the rising tide. Down the Gulf a bit at price, it's salt they're loading there, with reliance and the Mary and little room to spare. There's rats there crawling on the lines, fierce mosquitoes thick and bad, and the stink and heat from the mangrove flats would drive a saint half mad. I see catches windbound, catches tidebound, catches hard ashore. I see catches rotten in the mud, not needed anymore. I see catches wrecked and broken, the one my friend sailed on. Then my dream is only sadness, I've seen catches that are gone.